All right. So, um, right. I've been working on Rust a long time, since 2010. I think a lot of you know me, but I think a lot of you don't, at least based on my informal sample from, from earlier. So let me introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I started on Rust not at the very beginning, but kind of close to it. Uh, to give you an idea, the first thing I did on Rust, at the time, it only supported 32-bit systems, and I made it support 64-bit. Of course, now we support, I don't know what else, all kinds of other numbers of bits. But a lot of other stuff has happened in the meantime. The language has changed a lot, and I've been involved in some of that on and off. I helped found the compiler team. I've been involved in core governance stuff. Uh, these days, I'm mostly focused on language design work and this new fangled Rust types team. Some people here are in that team, yes. Uh, working and supporting the Rust type system and kind of helping build that out. I also lead and manage the Rust team at Amazon. So Amazon is using Rust for all kinds of things. And we're also investing in the community. We have a team of people, including myself, Compiler Eris is over there, and a few others uh, that directly work 100% on open source. Uh, so that's been a really great experience. It lets me work with people using Rust really closely, like Amazonian teams, learn how many different ways they can stub their toes and encounter problems, and then bring those lessons back, combine them with similar lessons from other people, and, and try to make it better for everyone. Uh, so that time since 2010, Rust has grown quite a bit, right? Um, just look at how many people are here, and you can see it. But these are some stats from LibsRS, kind of showing crates I.O. daily downloads. Doesn't really matter what you look at. It's always going up and up, and there's like a slight curve. I wouldn't mind seeing a little more of a curve, but nonetheless, a kind of accelerating rate of adoption that's pretty cool to see. But for me, this stuff, it's kind of abstract. I think the time that we knew Rust to hit it big time was in 2019, when it was in Batgirl. Maybe some of you remember. Uh, <laughs> and I was very grateful at the time because Rust has a reputation for being a little bit tricky to learn, but you know, not according to Batgirl. Where she was like, it's not complicated. So that's good. It's good public relations. That's what I like to hear. Uh, but what are people using it for? Well, you, I'd like later for you to tell me what you're using it for, if you're using it. But some of the things that I've seen the most adoption in the cloud, I mean, that's both building the cloud. So Microsoft, uh, as well as Amazon, are using it a lot. I think Google, too, but I don't know. Um, to build the foundational layers, but it's also as customers of the cloud, right? Running systems, people have found that yeah, if they write, rewrite their things in Rust, they'll pay less money. They'll need fewer servers. It'll last longer. That's a good benefit. But then we're also seeing now coming into the kernel. So we've got like Rust for Linux, which is awesome. We have Microsoft putting it into the Windows kernel, apparently, which is pretty awesome. And I think Rust was designed to be versatile, right? to go from super low level to super high level and pretty be pretty OK at all of that, maybe better at some than the other. But so seeing it go from like the low level kernel work all the way up to distributed systems, that's that's pretty gratifying, and I'm pretty excited about it. But maybe you're wondering, some of you are using it in your workplace, and some of you are like, mm, maybe I would like to, but how do I convince people? Or maybe I'm wondering, is it actually a good thing for me to use in my workplace? Does it make sense at the stuff that I work on? I think that's an interesting question, right? And you might be wondering, like, well, why do people use Rust in the first place? I think that's not exactly the right framing. That's a little too crude. We can refine it a little bit. And we can ask, sort of, why do people start using Rust? And for a lot of people, what I've heard is its efficiency. You know, they want to build like a badass system that's going to do really cool stuff and that they can be proud of. But they've kind of learned that when they try that in other languages, it doesn't always go so well, right? And you build this really cool system, and you start to run it, and then it just kind of falls over. And that could be because you hit memory safety errors if you're using C++. But also other languages like data races or other kinds of bugs crop up that make things just not actually work as well as you think they're going to. And people learn to be conservative, not try that ambitious design. Just do something straightforward. It's going to work well enough. But because Rust type system is there to handle the memory safety, it also helps address 
a lot of these other things and helps you build more reliable systems. Right? And that comes to the other side of the question. Like, if you start because of efficiency, what I usually hear is that's what people are first excited about, but the reason that they keep using it, the reason that it grows, is because actually it's better for building more reliable systems, or they're having success with that anyway. And so that's what I think really we love the most, right? That when we build something in Rust, it, it works. Now, I'm not the first one to observe this. I think the first time I saw it on stage was in 2017. Ashley, who's talking tomorrow, um, it was giving a great talk about using Rust at NPM and observed that it wasn't so much a problem with like TypeScript not being fast enough or whatever else. That was fine. But people just didn't like getting paged in the middle of the night. And Rust was helping avoid that. Right? And so if you're thinking about selling Rust, you might go listen to this talk. And you might think about, where is reliability an important thing? That might be something to emphasize. OK. So maybe you're wondering, what's coming in Rust over the next few years? What can we expect to change to improve? Well, one thing that's coming that I'm pretty excited about is the 2024 edition. So the edition is, well, how many people know what the Rust edition is? How many people don't know what the Rust edition is? OK, I'm going to pretend there were more hands, and I'm going to tell you. Maybe there's some people online. Uh, the Rust edition is a way to have kind of breaking changes, but no code breaking, which is pretty cool. Because it turns out you know, when you design something and ship it, you generally can't foresee the future perfectly. And you sometimes find you have to tweak things here or there. Maybe you got it 95% right, but you could have made a few decisions differently, and that would have, in retrospect, been better. Right? So what we try to do is basically have every crate, every library, declare what edition they're going to use. So next year, that'll be 2024, will be the newest one. That's what you'll get by default. That's kind of the best and greatest Rust. But the compiler continues to understand all the editions. So if you have some older package, it's still going to build. It's still going to work the same as it ever did. And you don't have to change. Nobody's forcing you. We're going to keep supporting it uh, indefinitely. But the other nice thing is they interoperate. Right? So even though you might be using an older edition, you can use libraries that use a newer edition, and it works, or vice versa. Maybe you're using the latest and greatest, but you're using libraries that haven't been updated. No problem. Right? So our goal is basically, oh, one more thing. Also, we try to make it really easy for you. <laughs> right? So if you, there are some things you have to do to adopt the newest edition. There are some changes you have to make in order to align with the new design. But for the most part, we'll do it for you. You can run the tool. We'll tweak your code. We'll fix it. Sometimes you have to do a little cleanup after that, but it's minimal. Now, the basically, the plan is you should be able to upgrade on your schedule, right? not ours. We're going to re-release it. We're going to release it sometime in 2024. If history holds, it'll be like December. 30th, 2024, but it'll be 2024. Uh, and that's when it's ready, but that's not when you have to adopt it. Maybe you're in the middle of shipping something, and you'd like to wait and put it on your backlog. That's fine, right? No problem. Just do it eventually. Otherwise, you won't get to enjoy the improved design. So the idea here is kind of feeds into a theme for Rust that I think is really important, of stability without stagnation. But we saw that reliability is super important. People want to be able to build things and have them keep working. But also, I don't know about you, but I, I like to see it continue to improve and get better at the same time. Right? And how can we reconcile that? Well, we try a number of different ways. Additions is one, probably the most dramatic. But it's also stuff like small standard library, so that the ecosystem can evolve really fast. Um, it's also stuff like, I forgot what my second example was. Well, I have more examples. It comes up a lot. <laughs> Um, it, it is basically well, uh, our release train, is what I was going to say. It's also stuff like releasing every six weeks so that you get new releases fast if you want them um, and make, get stuff out to you. Right? We avoid stagnating on that way. But additions are not only about breaking things or not breaking them. They're also just kind of a chance. It's every three years. Stuff moves fast in Rust. It's easy to kind of forget what's happened. Additions give you a chance to look back and 
say, hey, stuff has gotten a lot better in the meantime. That's really cool. So recently, I was thinking about this. What has happened since 2021? And of course, I had no idea, because that's like infinity from my point of view. But so I asked Twitter, <laughs> or whatever it is now, X, and uh, I got a lot of answers. And I got actually different answers than I expected, because I could think of a few things we had done. But the thing that came up by far the most was let else. Not just this time, but you know, a lot of times. And so what is let else? Let else is basically a convenience feature, a little syntactic sugar, where in the olden days, uh, before let else, you would have a situation like this, where maybe you have some function that returns an optional data, and you want to have another function that calls it and does something with the data. But if there is no data, you just have a trivial case. That's pretty normal. Like, well, if there's no data, I'm done. Fine. And then the main body of the function is here. And this setup is kind of annoying, because the trivial case is way at the bottom. The main function is indented to the right. Maybe this happens a few times, and your code is way over there. It's just rightward drift. And that's been annoying for a while. But we didn't really have a plan for what to do about it until let else came around, which is essentially a little way to write your uh, code a little differently so that you can have the main case, the sum case, and then you can have else to handle the rest. Right? So now I can return here. And then the main function, the unindented part, is like the, the happy path. So that's nice. The code reads better. But it's, it seems simple. But the path to get here is actually pretty long. Um, it's interesting to review it. Right? So first it begins, I didn't even show that, but with some discussion, somebody recognizes the problem. And eventually, kind of people coalesce around a design that they think is going to work, and they write a request for comment in RFC. That gets accepted. Somebody comes and implements it. Now it's available on Nightly. People experiment with it. They find problems. Eventually, we think we're ready to put it on the stable branch. OK, that's good. But there's a lot of things that are in this part of the stabilization. Right? To make a full-fledged feature isn't just writing the code. It's documenting the code in the Rust reference. It's fixing all the corner cases that don't quite behave, that you didn't think about when you did the main design, but turn out to be really important. Um, it's also adding it to the tooling, right? like Rust format or the IDE support, things like that. Um, and so once all that stuff is done, then the team members come and review the design, give their assent. So we use a consent-based system. And that's when the thing actually makes its way into your hands. And one thing you might have noticed, you maybe can't read it, but if you look at this, you'll see there's a lot of different names here. And actually, the person who drove the stabilization, EST31, who is not here as far as I know, but it would be cool if they were, they actually did a great job collecting all those names. Right? So for this feature, there's a lot of people. I can't name them all. But we got the ones who wrote the RFC, the ones who did the code, the ones who did the tooling. And I note that they didn't include the Rust format people, I think because that work hadn't been done yet, actually. Um, <laughs> so it's not their fault. But there's more that aren't on here. And I think I just realized I didn't include whoever worked on it in Rust Analyzer. Hats off to you and to other IDEs. So uh, it's a lot of work. It takes a village. right? And that's just the one thing. That's just let else. There's a lot of other stuff, like we now have cargo add. I think that was Ed Page on the cargo team who drove that. But that came out of the community, so whoever built the crate in the first place. We have inline assembly. Amaniu drove that, along with others. Hash map implementing more imples. Libs team, I don't know. Const generics. Generic associated types. So uh, for that, I think Jack's here somewhere, but also Matthew Jasper. We've got a lot of great people worked on that. Uh, scoped threads. Mara's here. We can give her your thanks for that API. And my personal favorite of all the tweets I saw was this one that said, do the major strides in Rust Analyzer count? And it's like, hell yes. <laughs> yeah, that counts. That's one of the great things that's happened over the last few years. Right? And I would add, I saw in the sponsor table, they're here today, JetBrains, or Rust Rover. I've been playing with it. It's really cool. It's great to have fancy working IDEs that feel like, you know, feel like other languages, feel like mature languages. How cool is that? And not just one, but multiple. I want to also point out Rust Analyzer, open source project. They have an open collective. These slides are online. If you can't find this link, find the slides, or just search for it. Uh, support it if you think that it's something that you use. That would be great. All right. 
Let me turn to something that's not quite there yet, but will be there by the Rust 2024 edition and talk a little bit about the evolution of async I.O. in Rust. This is something I've been personally following pretty closely. So ever since Rust 1.39 in November 2019, we've had async await. Maybe some of you have used it, I expect. It's a great way to do scalable network I.O. And it's using a design that we took from, well, we based at least the syntax on say, C-sharp, JavaScript, a lot of languages have built this in, Python, right? You can write an async function. That returns a kind of future, which, well, actually, let me show you the desugared version first. Um, so you can write an async function, but in Rust, that's desugared, converted into this lower level version, right, of a function that returns a future, which is basically a chunk of deferred work, something that hasn't happened yet. And when that future is awaited, it's going to execute. And to create the future, you write an async block that takes some work and says, put that off. I'll do it later. And returns, so it doesn't do the work, but it returns a future that will do the work. OK, that's great. It's let us build up a lot of stuff. Um, all kinds of systems on the internet are built on this basis. We have Tokyo and other runtimes doing super high efficiency things. We have embedded runtimes based on this. Uh, and, but it's had some fundamental limitations that we haven't lifted, right? So you can use it in a top-level function, but there's a lot of other places that we write functions where it doesn't work. You can't use it in traits. You can't use it in impulse of traits. And you can't use the underlying version either, right? This impl future form. None of that stuff works on stable. Now, there is a workaround. Oops. You can use this async trait crate, and that's great, super awesome. It unblocks a lot of people, but it also introduces some inefficiency. It allocates things. It uses dynamic dispatch. It doesn't work for, say, a highly generic library like Tower or one, like a middleware library. Th these things want to be much more flexible. They don't want to add that required overhead. So not having this feature not only means you don't get to use it, it means you don't get to use the really cool libraries that would have been built had it been available. Right? And so it's been kind of holding back the ecosystem at large. So I'm happy to say, unless something unforeseen has happened in the <laughs> last week or happens in the next couple of weeks, um, once December 28th comes around, remember I talked about squeaking in by the end of the year, uh, we're going to have this feature available in 2023, um, at least a version of it. <laughs> um, so in Rust 1.75, you will be able to write arrow impl future in your trait, or actually arrow impl any other trait you want, more or less, iterators, closures, whatever. You can write traits that return these types. Um, that works. And you can, of course, implement those traits too. That's good. It would be kind of annoying otherwise. Um, and so this all works just fine. So I can write an async trait in some sense uh, in this desugared form. I can have the body have an async move block. That's a great unblocker. Of course, because an async function is just sugar for an impl trait, I can also, in the impl, write an async function. These two things are entirely equivalent. They both work. That's really cool. And of course, then I can use this like any other trait. Right? So I can write, say, an async function that's generic over some type h, bound it by handler, call h.handle. I'm going to get back a future. I'm going to await the future. That works. Um, oop, one too many. That works fine. Uh, unlike when you're using the, the procedural macro that you used to use, this is the same as any other trait, right? So static dispatch, no, the compiler can fully optimize it. There's no allocation. Um, and where you have kind of extended that to a more uniform language surface. Now, you might be wondering, what about async functions in trait? Right? So I talked about impl future in trait. And I talked about impl future in an impl and async functions in an impl. You can also put async function in a trait. It's just sugar. It works fine. But you are going to get a warning. And the reason is we're not yet finished. So this feature works fine. It works exactly like we want. The problem is there are some other features we don't have yet. And if you don't have those and you don't realize that there are some limitations, you can get yourself into trouble. Right? So we're giving you a warning so that you can go read what the limitations are and decide the best way to handle it, and then come back and decide if you want to use it or if you want to keep waiting and use workarounds. 
either one is okay. Either way, you're better off than you were before. So what are those limitations? I'm not going to go into super detail, um, but these are links to blog posts and things. There's lots of information out there. Um, the upshot of the main one, the worst one, is that when you write an async function in a trait, today, as of December 28th, or not today, but as of December 28th, you essentially have to decide, is it movable across threads? Is it sendable or not? Right? And for most applications, that's OK, because they only care about one or the other. Um, so if you're using like Tokyo and its default configuration, you can write impl future plus send, and it works fine. If you're using an embedded thing or a single-threaded executor, which is another popular configuration, you can use async function or impl future, and it works fine. What doesn't quite work yet without these extra features is having one trait that works for any use case you want. Right? And that's what we want to get to, and we're going to get there, but we're not there yet. The other thing that doesn't work today is dynamic dispatch. I said that we're enabling static dispatch, but at least not natively. You can't use dynamic dispatch, which is something a lot of people want to do so that they don't have to have generics everywhere. Uh, the good news is here there's more easy workarounds. I don't think we've shipped or created a, pr a, a procedural macro yet, but we have talked about it and probably will that lets you kind of generates the boilerplate so you don't have to think about this. So this isn't as serious, but we also plan to fix it because we want it to work as smoothly as we possibly can. Now, you might wonder, OK, so there's these limitations. Why are we stabilizing async functions now? Maybe we should wait until everything is perfect. And this comes back to stability without stagnation. Right? We could do that, but there's a lot of people for whom what we have is, is perfect. It meets everything they need, or it lets them build with procedural macros the things they need. So we prefer to get it out there, get it into your hands, let you build on it, and continue iterating to perfection. Right? If we wait to get everything perfect, then we'll never ship. So if you are hitting one of these use cases, chances are it's going to work great for you. If you hit some rough edges, there will be workarounds. You have to know that. Uh, and hopefully, eventually, by the end of 2024, we'll have smoothed those out, and you won't have to know that either. Yeah, cross your fingers. Um, <laughs> I should shout out to Compiler Arrows. I had a slide on it. I don't know where it went. Who did a lot of the implementation work here, and other people like TC, who have done a lot of organizational work. So just like every feature, there's, there's a huge litany of people behind this effort. Uh, so I want to come back to additions a little bit, because it's kind of, this is a good example of the kind of breaking changes that we're able to make now only because of additions that let us make Rust better overall without actually really disrupting anybody in practice. Um, so I told you that async functions desugar to impl future. That's true. But what I didn't tell you, and I kind of carefully curated my examples to avoid, is that desugaring to impl future isn't always that straightforward in Rust 2021. Especially if you have references with lifetimes, you have to actually make sure they appear in the bounds. And if there's only one, that's not too hard. You can do this. But if there's more than one, it's actually quite tricky. And we, f we went looking and found most people do it wrong, um, <laughs> actually. And so uh, this, this rule wasn't, th in, in hindsight, this decision to make you explicitly list references wasn't so good. Um, most of the crates don't, would prefer to just capture everything, almost every use case, not all, but many, many, many. And also, it made infiltrate in traits rather complicated for various reasons. It was hard to make everything consistent the way we wanted it if we kept this rule. So we're going to change it. At least that's the current plan. I don't think this RFC is accepted yet. Uh, so there's an RFC 3498. And in Rust 2024, you won't need this plus tick H anymore. It'll be implicit. Rust 2021 continues as it ever was. We'll give you some tooling, I hope, to take those away. Or I don't know, maybe we won't, but we'll, hopefully we will. I'm going to say we will. Uh, and because they don't hurt you, so it's a little tricky. Anyway, the point is we're able to make a smoother, better Rust. And for the most part, most people like, didn't understand this rule before. And now they don't have to think about it now. And so it's even better, right? Um, OK, that's kind of what we're definitely going to do. But what about looking a little further out? Right? And I want to emphasize, this is my personal take here. Some of the stuff I'm talking about is not, it's not like this is team consensus. It's not like the Amazon people have a consensus on this. None of the other hats that I wear. This is just me telling you what I think. But I see some pretty big problems, eh, opportunities 
for rust going out, things we can do that will make it a lot better, and that I don't quite know how to solve, but I hope we'll find ways. Um, so one of them I th is scaling the community out. And by this I mean I've observed that Rust libraries are often really great. <laughs> They're kind of the best in class. And I think there's a talk Nikolai was telling me about how to make your Rust library great. So uh, coming up later, maybe today. Um, so that will be cool. But like, we have a lot of great libraries, like Tokyo and Regex and, and whatever, um, Serde and so on, that, that do really great stuff. A lot of them build on procedural macros, auto-derive. That's part of how we are able to do this. So you don't have to write all this boilerplate code. We have these really powerful primitives, and we can generate them for you, and then you just get to enjoy it. But the problem is when you use that, a lot of the details leak through. Right? You end up having to know about those details, even though you don't have to write them, but you have to understand the weird error messages that you get and figure out how to solve those problems. I think a lot of you know what I'm talking about. So in some ways, even though we're their best in class, the Rust libraries are just so limited. They can't give you good lints. They can't give you suggestions. The compiler does all kinds of cool stuff for you uh, that libraries can't do. You also can't integrate them as nicely into IDEs and debuggers. I mean, you sort of can, but you're, it's weird, right? You're hard coding like specific projects into your IDE and stuff like that. It doesn't feel right. So how can we sort of overcome this? Right? And I think we can by, by extending the compiler, by giving new mechanisms, and letting people integrate. Um, I think some of the people in the types team may be shaking their heads, maybe not, about how terrifying this is. OK, thumbs up. That's good. Um, but you know, it's going to be some time to figure out how to do a stable, or at least sufficiently stable, version of these APIs to let people hook in. But I think we can really turn Rust into a platform where you can build a best-in-class library that gives a best-in-class developer experience as if it were built into the language, right? which we're not quite there yet. Now, the other thing about the ecosystem that I see is we have a lot of fragmentation. We have a small standard library. That's awesome, because we don't bake in a lot of choices that are really hard to change. Right? We let people build and experiment, and sometimes what seems like the best plan becomes superseded later by another crate, and that's fine. But the problem is it's really hard to move between those crates. So maybe you're building everything on one async runtime. This is a common example. And then you'd like to try another one that fits maybe your, your profile better. That's a lot of work. That's almost impossible to do unless you have a really simple application. The same with like serialization and deserialization, memory allocation, encryption. The list goes on and on and on of like things where we have really great options, but you have to pick one up front and bake it in, and it's kind of hard to change. I would like to see, you know, ideally, you'd kind of have some standards arise. After enough experience has been gained, we would say, oh, here's an interface, and then you can work against that interface, and then you can easily switch back and forth. But often that just doesn't happen, right? And there's a bunch of reasons for that. Like in the async space, part of it is we don't have async functions in trait. So you, couldn't, you literally couldn't build the interface even if you wanted to. We're going to fix that. But even once we fix that, I think we're going to see that it's really hard. Uh, and I think that's because of a variety of obstacles. Like the coherence rules, for example, make it hard. Uh, you kind of have to, uh, I won't go into details. We can talk about it in the questions. But suffice to say, I think it, it, there is incentives that make it actually hard to ship a standard, evolve it in the ecosystem, get it adopted, and move it into the standard library. It becomes another one of those things where it kind of has to be in the standard library to be workable. Um, same with uh, cargo doesn't make necessarily make this easy. There are new features we could do. Um, this fact that we do static linking makes this harder to do. So I don't know how to solve this. I'm not, this is kind of a complex problem with a bunch of angles. But I think it is something we want to address if we really want to see people get the most out of the ecosystem, which is such a big part of what makes Rust great. I'm going to end briefly by just mentioning the fact that, as always, and virtually every talk I give ends like this, I feel like, which is interesting. Uh, if you've ever tried to get involved in Rust or follow Rust, you'll know that there is a lot of stuff going on. That's awesome. It means we're really active. We're doing a lot of things. But if you think back to that like let else chain, it took a lot of people coordinating over issues and things. And sometimes that works really great. And sometimes that's really stressful and really hard. And people kind of bounce off. I would like to get involved in Rust, but I can't figure out where to start. So I think we need to do more to improve the way we organize, to make it transparent so that people can know what's, up, what's coming up, both Rust users, Rust companies, or Rust using companies, uh, Rust contributors. 
We have to do more, but we have to also not lose some of that open source magic, right? Some of that ability to come in and have a problem that isn't on anybody's radar and drive it all the way to solution and get it accepted, even though it wasn't on like a top-down roadmap. That's part of what makes some of the best parts of Rust have come out of that, and we'll, I think that will continue to be true, so we have to balance those. Um, there's a panel that I think will probably hit on some of this stuff, so I'll leave it out for now, but just note that's another high priority for us. All right. Thank you very much. I uh, don't know how my timing is, but hopefully it's good. And I want to just say thank you to all the Euro Rust organizers for bringing us all together. And I want to say um, I'm looking forward to talking to you afterwards. So, bye. <laughs>